chapter one. He adored New York City. I write in the book the first time that I met him. I went in and it was just to see whether or not to do a story for the New York Times magazine. And I, had, I was very nervous and I had all my questions in front of me and I had a tape recorder. He was very shy and I was very nervous. It was not a good combination. And um, his shortest answer was no, which wouldn't have been so bad, but his longest answer was yes. So that wasn't so good. Um, but then something happened and we started, we had another chance to talk. And from that time on, it's just gone on. You know, I expected it to last for a few interviews, and, but it's now, it's now been 39 years and it's gone on and it's been wonderful for both of us, much more for me, I think. I have probably 2,000 pages of transcript from our interviews from over the years. Most conversations books, somebody sits down in his 60s or his 70s and says, this is what I remembered when I was 30. This is what I did. Well, you know, memory is, memory is what we make of it, you know, and we all have our histories and our stories that we want to tell. And the nice thing about this book is, is that he doesn't have to remember what he said when he was 30, because I have it there. Um, and so, and all through the years. And so one of the benefits of doing this book was I took the aspects of filmmaking, getting the idea and writing it and shooting it and casting it. And then just drew back from all of the conversations that we had going back to 1971 or 1972. And so each chapter goes from then until 2008. So the benefit of that is you can really hear what he has to say at the time and you can really trace somebody's evolution about whatever aspect of filmmaking it is. And the other benefit of this is, I think, depending on what you're interested in reading, this is a book that I meant for people to be able to move around in. So if one day you're interested in cinematography, you can read that chapter and you won't lose anything. Or if you're interested in how he gets the idea, you can read that and it won't bother you. I think he still sticks with a lot of the same themes. Probably the most common one is the unpredictability of love. You can just never tell what's going to happen. So whatever works, which is just opened here, is very much about that. People start off in one course and suddenly they find they're, they're in another. Whatever love you can get and give, whatever happiness you can provide, every temporary measure of grace, whatever works. When you see kids tossing a ball, does it ever make you miss spring training? All right. I have never played for the Yankees. If you look at the other themes of things that he does, he writes about loyalty, which he did in, in, in uh, Broadway, Danny Rose. There's a film in a couple of instances about the difference between the man and the artist. So Deconstructing Harry and, Bro and Bullets Over Broadway are very much about, uh, you can be a wonderful artist, but a terrible person. You know, you have to just keep the two of them different. Son of a bitch. What's wrong? You sick, 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 sick fucking bastard. What's wrong? What, what is wrong? wrong? What is wrong? What do you think is wrong? So you've been having a little bit of an affair with one of my patients, huh? He also no, writes a great deal about the, the about distinction you. between fantasy and reality. We love fantasy. All we want to do is have a fantasy life. So in Purple Rose of Cairo, you know, an actor walks off the screen and into your life and you can have the most wonderful fantasy life, except his money's no good in the real world. And in the end, you're stuck with reality. And as, as Woody says, which he finds really offensive, by the way, is that reality kills you. In the end, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you end up dead. If you look at Match Point, here's the perfect story of somebody who commits two awful, terrible murders. He's a terrible human being, but he gets away with it. And he goes on with his life, and you can see that he's just going to be unfazed forever. But then in Cassandra's Dream, which is very Dostoevskyan, Here's somebody who also gets away with murder, but his conscience undoes him. It's also very much a story of Cain and Abel. It's two brothers and, you know, who get into a fight. But, so these larger themes are played out sometimes comically and sometimes dramatically, but they're very much at the heart of, of what he does, and he's really kept those ideas uh, constantly refreshed. I know that there will be many more wonderful biographies of Woody Allen than I've done. I don't think it'll be a better conversation book because nobody else has 40 years of conversation that they can draw on. And I also know is that people who do biographies in the future will have all of these interviews to draw on because they'll be in a public university someplace for people to, to use. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that 100 years from now people will still watch his movies, that it will be, it'll be a reflection not only of life at this time, but I think one of, the most, one of the most important things about his films is that many movies really are a product of the decade or the year that they're made in. And his movies really have a, 
timeless quality. They're modern, but they could happen pretty much at any time. A movie like Annie Hall, made in the 1970s, looks as relevant today, apart from the clothes that people wear and the style of the clothes, as it would be if we're, as, as it, it, would, it looks as good now as it does as it did then. For the biographer writing about the dead, you have to go back and try to reconstruct something that happened. I can report something that happened in terms of how he made a film or what he did in a performance or what he talked about doing what he was doing and why he was doing it and at least have his version of it. Just before I came to Brazil, I, I was in New York and so I went over to say hello because I hadn't seen him for a while and I said, I know people are going to ask me, are you going to make a movie in Brazil? So, so what's the answer? And he said, my sister came down, as you know, and she had very nice meetings and really liked the place. Um, and she, he said, you know, I could see us doing a movie there. He said, but right now, the financing for my film comes from a group in Spain. So I have the needs that I need to do for them, to help them with their investment. So for the time being, I think you won't see it here. But who knows what happens is, you know, when that deal is, is finished. <laughs>